Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the EMV protocol. This is how the security protocol is known, but in each of the countries that EMV is used in, it's known by something different. In the UK, it's known as chip and pin, but elsewhere it has different names. But essentially, they're all the same system at heart. The system was developed by Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, and that's where this name's come from. And it's used pretty much all over the world. The only exception is the US. It's used for both credit and debit, although not all countries use that, and is also used for both point of sale and ATM transactions. So the overall scheme is, is smart card payments. And as of this year, there are 750 million cards currently deployed. That's comparable to the number of internet connected computers. But if you compare the amount of an analysis that's gone into EMV compared to SSL and TOS, it hasn't got the attention that it deserves. The reason that I've got interested in this is that almost on a weekly basis, someone comes to me or one of my colleagues and says that they've lost some money from their account and the bank isn't giving their money back. The reason the banks say is because EMV is infallible, therefore if the computer says that your card made a transaction, then that card did do the transaction and therefore it's your personal liability, you're responsible. What they'll often try to do is blame your friends and family. They'll say that someone else had accessed your card and used it without your authorization. And this is a big problem. At the last British crime survey, they found that 44% of fraud victims didn't get all of their money back. Some lost a little bit of money, but some lost a lot. Um, I was talking to one just a few weeks ago who lost 10,000 pounds and the bank haven't refunded them. So to understand how well chip and pin is doing, we can look at the fraud figures. Here, the UK is quite good because they publish quite detailed figures on the losses to the industry. And what we're mainly interested in is the period during which chip and pin was deployed. So it started in about 2002, but cards are expensive and the bank didn't want to replace everyone's cards all at the same time. So they rolled out gradually and the rollout was complete by 2005. I'm going to look at three different types of fraud. The, the first is counterfeit. This is someone making a copy of your card and then using it for fraudulent purposes. Then there's lost and stolen, where someone steals the card from you. Either they mug you or they find your bag or break into your car, get your card somehow, and then use it for purchases. And then finally, there's mail non-receipt. This is where the bank is sending you the card, and then the fraudster takes it out of the mail or redirects it somehow, and then uses that card for fraudulent purposes. The chip and pin system is designed to defend against all of these, but in different ways. The chip has a cryptographic key which is used for carrying out the rest of the protocol. And the chip is designed not to release this key. And that makes these cards harder to copy compared to the MagStripe system that came before. So the chip tries to protect against counterfeit fraud. But it doesn't protect against lost and stolen because obviously someone who has the card has the chip. So that's why the pin was introduced. To prevent lost and stolen cards and mail non-receipt, in order to carry out a transaction with a chip and pin card, you have to type in the correct pin, or at least that's what was hoped. So if we look at how well these two measures have done, it looks fairly good in terms of the pin. So lost and stolen has gone down, and mail non-receipt has gone down. But in terms of the chip, it's not quite as good, because as the chip and pin system was rolled out, fraud went down initially, but then it started going up as the criminals started to adapt. I talked about this in 25C3, where I showed that it's possible to put a paperclip into one of these devices and then read someone's cards, card number and their PIN and then use this to create a fake card. And that's exactly what criminals have been doing. But now if you look at card not present fraud, that was something that chip and PIN was not designed to defend against. Card not present is internet orders or mail orders. Any 
sort of transaction where the card is not being physically presented to the person you're buying something off. And here you can see that fraud rocketed. As criminals found out that they weren't able to carry out their old types of fraud, they adapted. And then they did things like phishing attacks where they would send you an email and ask for some card details um, or do any number of different things such as like uh, breaking into merchants and getting card numbers from them and then using these for fraud online. So overall, the fraud figures after the introduction of chip and pin was fraud increased. But things started changing last year. For the first time ever, card not present fraud went down. One suspicion of why this was is the banks introduced something called Verify by Visa. MasterCard has a similar system called uh, Secure Code. And here, you have to type in a password when you're going through the final stages of your online transaction. And that means that if you just get someone's card number, then that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to carry out online transactions. But it's not just the card not present fraud that went down. Last year, counterfeit fraud went down. And again, this is the, the first time ever, except the just after the introduction of chip and pin. Here, the reason is believed to be that although chip and pin was introduced many years ago, it wasn't mandatory. It meant that if someone could steal your card details, for example, as I demonstrated, taking them out of a chip and pin terminal, you might not be able to use those, you, you wouldn't be able to use those details in the UK, but you could take them abroad. What's happened now is it's much harder to use a non-chip and pin card outside of the UK or outside of the country it was issued. The bank will quite likely turn it down um, unless you've told them that you're traveling. So that made life harder for the fraudsters. And if we look at the fraud figures overall, it starts to look fairly positive um, last year. The exception is online fraud. That's um, the, the blue line at the top. Um, that's the, one, that's the only one that's been increasing. And I talked about that at last year's CCC, that even though many of the UK banks have deployed a system for doing um, using your EMV card for online banking authentication, it's not working all that well because fraud has, started, uh, as fraud has continued to increase. The only time it decreased was in 2007, and that was because one bank was responsible for over 80% of all fraud. They just didn't have a, a good enough security team, and 2007 was the year that they managed to get their act together. But since then, it's just been increasing again. Now, this starts to look fairly positive. Some fraud's gone down, some fraud's gone up, but the overall figures has gone down. In 2008, it was 704 million pounds, and in 2009, it's 529. But this picture only tells part of the story. This figure only lists losses to shops and losses to the bank. It doesn't include that 44% of customers who don't get their money back. So could there be a change there? Well. Once, for example, the Verify by Visa system was introduced, not only was this extra password added, but also the terms and conditions were changed. And here's an extract from one of them, from the Royal Bank of Scotland. They say that you understand that you're financially responsible for all uses of RBS Secure. So before the system came in, if you were the victim of a card not present fraud, you would almost certainly get your money back. Now that's no longer the case. So maybe some of that drop, or all of that drop, is due to customers losing rather than the banks losing. And it's a very similar story when it comes to chip and pin. This is a, a statement from American Express where they were denying a customer a refund and they said something like um, chip and pin cards cannot, uh, chip and pin charges cannot be disputed as the card would have to be in possession when the charges were put through. So basically, because chip and pin is infallible, the card must have been there, you must have typed in the right pin, therefore it's your fault. Well, it turns out the banks were wrong. We will stay with the question of money because most of us don't think twice about paying for something in a high street shop by keying in our pin. It's easy, it's fast, and in most cases it works. But scratch a little under the surface and there are persistent reports of people who say they've been the subject of fraud of one kind or another on their credit card or their debit card. 
Now a team of computer scientists at Cambridge University has found a flaw in chip and pin so serious they think it shows that the whole system needs a rewrite. Our science editor Susan Watts has the story. We have to question the, the entire uh, architecture uh, that surrounds chip and pin. It really is time for um, a closer look to be taken in this whole area. But this flaw is really a whopper. Well, we think this is one of the biggest flaws um, that we've ever uncovered, that has ever been uncovered against payment systems. And, you know, I've been in this business 25 years. This is um, a flaw on a system that's used by hundreds of millions of people, by tens of thousands of banks, by millions of merchants. So how does the attack work? Essentially what it does is exploit a flaw in the chip and pin system that allows the terminal to think that a correct pin was entered and the card to think that a signature authorized the transaction. So at the end, the receipt says verified by pin. The bank is going to think that the pin was entered correctly, but uh, the criminal actually did not know the pin. Cambridge University gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, SAR is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The kit wouldn't have to be this big. The team's already working on miniaturizing it into a unit the size of a remote control. Saar has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? Hello. He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card. Any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorised by signature. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by PIN. In fact, Saar tried a handful of high street debit and credit cards, keying in 0000, 000, 000 as the PIN, and it worked every time. So is this attack happening in the real world? The Consumers Association thinks chip and pin has helped to bring down instances of card crime, but many cases remain unexplained. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how big this problem is. What we do know from our um, investigations is that, say, around 14% of, of, of consumers on a representative basis will have said that they have suffered some kind of um, financial loss, which they believe is through fraud. The percentage of that which is actually from th uh, this type of potential problem with chip and pin is something that's a lot less clear. What we do know is that we do have cases that are brought forward from individuals which seem quite persuasive. We understand that behind the scenes, some of the banks are already working on fixing this flaw. But they obviously haven't all fixed it yet, because the banks didn't alert any of us to the purchases we made using the Cambridge attack, our cards, and a pin of 0000. So let's see what's actually going on there when we carried out that attack. The EMV protocol is complicated. It's ridiculously complicated. It's 4,000 pages long from the specifications that are publicly available, and there's more secret specifications which go into more detail. So this is radically simplified, and also here I'm talking about how it's used in the UK and a few other countries. Um, this isn't necessarily universal. The first stage is called card authentication. Here, the card presents to the terminal a digitally signed certificate, an RSA signed certificate that gives its card number, um, the cardholder name, and a few other bits and pieces. Then the customer is asked to enter in the PIN, and then the terminal sends to the card the PIN exactly as it's been entered by the customer. The card checks whether it's correct and then sends a, a yes or no answer back.